So, can you hear me? Σταύρο, γεια σου. Καλά είσαι. Καλημέρα, κύριε καθηγητά μου. Καλημέρα. Σε βλέπω μια χαρά. Ωραία. Ελπίζω να συνδεθούμε λίγο αργότερα. Μπορεί να έχει καθηγητά. Καλημέρα, Αθανάση. Καλημέρα, Σταύρο. Κώστα, καλημέρα. Γεια σου, γεια σου, Κώστα. Θα βρούμε το πρόγραμμα. Okay, okay. Τα νάση ανέλαβα, κύριε καθηγητά μου. <coughs> Ορκίστηκα. Συγχαριστήρια, Σταύρο, συντεροκέφαλο. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Έχω τώρα δέκα μέρε. Την έναρξη τη χρονιά τη Ακαδημαϊκή. Κοίταξε, εγώ τα είδα, τα πρόσθεσα στο LinkedIn και τα είδα εκεί πέρα να πούμε. Οπότε μην ανησυχεί. Δεν ανησυχώ. Επομένω είναι μέχρι τι 2 η ώρα. Θα είμαστε. 12 παρά με 2. Είπε ο Κώστας να προλογίσει στη θήτη του δύο πρώτου, στη συνέχεια ο Κώστας τον Έξταϊν και τον Βίκνελ, το φίλο μου τον Κόλιν, και εγώ τον Κακίση, τον Μουλακάκη και τον Ιαν. Θα έχουμε συζήτηση όμως. Ξέρεις, Θανάση. Κώστα, θα έχουμε συζήτηση. Ε, εντάξει, τώρα. Δεν χτυπάμε τα πόνα. Εντάξει. Ναι. Okay. Τώρα έχει coffee break. Να προσθέσω, ε. Θα πάτε στο ESDS, κύριε. Εγώ σταύρω όχι, θα το παρακολουθήσω από απόσταση. Θα... Φανάσει, σταύρω με ακούτε. Μάλιστα, μάλιστα. Οκ, okay. θα ξεκινήσω και όπως είπαμε θα δώσω το λόγο στον κύριο Γιαννούκα, στον Σταύρο τον Κάκο και μετά θα πω τους πρώτους ομιλητές και μετά ο... Ο κύριο Γιαννούκα, ο επόμενο δύο και ο κύριο Κάκο, ο επόμενο τρει. Το είπα κόστο αυτό γιατί με έχει πάρει τηλέφωνο χθε και το συζητήσαμε. Φανάση δεν έχει κάνει κάτι να κάνει με το σύμπαν αυτό. Κύριο Λιάπη, μήπω. Ε... Μήπω πάει κάποιο να πει και στον κύριο Λιάπη. Δηλαδή. Δεν πειτάγεσαι λίγο. Και ό,τι θέλει κάνει. Πες στον κύριο Λιάπη, με την έννοια ότι... Αυτό δεν σε ακούω, διακόπηκε η κοινωνία. Όχι, περιμένουμε ένα-δύο λεπτά τον κύριο Λιάπη να πει και αυτός αν θέλει στην αίθουσα και να ξεκινήσουμε. Ωραία. Ναι, ακούτε. Ναι, ναι. Okay. Dear colleagues, I welcome you in this second session uh, of this symposium, which uh, focuses uh, mainly in uh, pararenal aneurysms and some critical issues uh, of the, for the endovascular treatment of infrarenal ones. On behalf of my co-chairs, Professor Thanasius Giannoukas 
and Stavros Kakos, I would like to thank the European distinguished uh, colleagues who will, uh, by their presence, give honor and uh, value to our Congress, namely Hans Henning Eckstein from uh, Munich, Germany, professor also uh, Ian Loftus at St. George's uh, University in London, and Colin Bicknell uh, at Imperial College in London too. In addition, we will uh, attend four known Greek vascular surgeons, Professor John Kakisis and Kostadinos Moulakakis, and then Doctors uh, Kostas Andonopoulos and Andreas Panagiotopoulos. A short comment for myself, for our Professor Chris Liapis, who is being honored today. Uh, the scientific work of Professor Liapis is recognized by the international vascular community, and he himself has given uh, a number of uh, prestigious awards. From my point of view, I would like to say that when I was a resident, he was an associate professor at Glycol Hospital, and uh, I, uh, I cherished his presence in all activities. I remember his hard working, both of which aimed at showing what uh, is the balance of a dedicated clinical and academic vascular surgeon. Uh, Professor Yapis, to my view, is among the few in Greece who transformed our specialty from a group of special techniques to a modern and mindful decision-making uh, specialty based on evidence. I admire him and I thank him for his support to me and all others. And I would like to ask him to continue influencing uh, the new generation because he's so ca capable of accomplishing uh, such a challenging task. I would like to give the microphone to Professor Giannoukas and Steve uh, Kakos, and then we'll start the first presentation. Professor Giannoukas. Uh, thank you very much, Kostas. Dear colleagues, I'm very honored for this invitation to co-chair uh, this session with uh, my friends and uh, very close um, and good colleagues, uh, Professor Stavros Kakos and Professor Kostadinos Filis. I think that this uh, session is a session that uh, includes uh, important speakers, panelists, who have a great experience in the management of complex aortic aneurysms. And I'm sure that uh, this particular uh, session is going to be very interesting uh, for uh, all those who will attend it. And I urge uh, everybody then to contribute to the discussion. Uh, Finally, I would like to say a few words regarding uh, my close friend, uh, Professor Christos Liapis, who everybody knows him, is one of the most uh, important figures in vascular surgery in our country with international uh, uh, relationships and uh, has, uh, has been uh, president of the European Society of Vascular Surgery, president of the Hellenic Society of Vascular Surgery, and his achievements uh, are, uh, I would say, uh, one of the landmarks in the history of vascular surgery in Greece. Uh, I wish him uh, every success in uh, his uh, life and I enjoy his friendship. Thank you, Professor Giannoukas. I'm Stavros Kakos from Patras. I would like to first thank the organizers of this symposium for the invitation uh, to allow me to chair this very important session on complex aortic aneurysms. These are, as well know, high-risk procedures and the only way to go forward through clinical outcomes is to have these procedures performed in high-volume centers like the one is organizing me today, which is the only department of vascular surgery 
of Athens University located in Atticon General Hospital. So, uh, Costas, we can carry on with the first presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Let's start our program. I would like to invite uh, Andreas Panagiotopoulos to the podium to give us a talk on the 30 day postoperative mortality. It does not capture the full picture of post mortality in superior aneurysm treated with open surgery. Honorable Professor Christos Lapis, Chairman, dear colleagues, I would like to thank you for the invitation. I will try to be concise and comprehensive. Uh, during my presentation. I will start by saying that preoperative mortality rate is not just a statistical indicator. It's a significant outcome of quality and safety of care. As we know, there are two uh, preoperative mortality reporting models uh, used in common practice. 30 day mortality that refers to the deaths within 30 days of surgery and the in hospital mortality that uh, refers to deaths uh, before the discharge from the hospital. On uh, the next slide, we have uh, the conclusion of uh, an article that was published in the Journal of uh, Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery in 2014, where it states that. Readjusting the definition of mortality by using different parameters for time and place of occurrence can reveal some deaths that may have not been captured under the previous definitions of mortality. From uh, our experience during the continuum from 2015 up to 2020, 83 patients were electively treated uh, in, in a department for uh, complex aortic aneurysm uh, with uh, open surgery. We had 55 patients with uh, jugular renal aneurysms and uh, 28 patients with suprarenal aneurysm. On the next slide, uh, we can see the distribution of the patients based uh, on the type of, uh, of the aneurysm. And here we can see the baseline patient characteristics with uh, the most uh, common comorbidities presenting at the time of uh, the admission. It's worth noticing that uh, the patients on uh, the suprarenal group had less uh, prevalence on these uh, comorbidities. The mean length of stay uh, of our patients was 14 days with 72.3% uh, of the patients needing to be hospitalized for up to 30 days and uh, a significant 27.7% of patients had to uh, be remain hospitalized for more than 30 days. Uh, during the, um, the post-operative uh, period, uh, there was uh, some complications experienced, uh, mostly cardiac, pulmonary, and renal. And uh, in the first column, we can see the, the complications within the 30 days of the operation. On um, the second column, we see the, the complications whose uh, results extended uh, for more than 30 days. And uh, we had some complications that occurred after the 30 days uh, from the operation, mainly cardiac and, and pulmonary. Speaking about uh, mortality, and in 30-day uh, mortality, we had four patients who died from the ejector renal group and two patients from the suprarenal group, respectively. Total, uh, six patients in total with a percentage of 7.2% 30-day mortality. But uh, when we looked at uh, the in-hospital mortality, the, the patients who died from the jugular renal group were, were, were five and uh, four from the suprarenal group, respectively. Nine patients in total and raising the in-hospital mortality to 10.8%. Uh, 
visualizing these results on the next diagram, we've put a red line in, uh, in the, on the 30 days. And when focusing on uh, the 30 day mortality, uh, we can see in the lowest uh, increments the immediate post operative deaths due to surgical complication, and then uh, the distribution uh, of, uh, of the death cases uh, uh, up to uh, the 30 days from the operation. But uh, when we expanded our results to, to include uh, the death, uh, the late, the excess death cases, uh, we saw that there was a 3.6% discrepancy between the 30 day mortality and the in -host, total in hospital mortality. Uh, a, a key point uh, that uh, should be disclosed is that all of our patients who died. Uh, after the 30 days, we were admitted in uh, the ICU and had uh, multiple uh, comorbidities. So, uh, our data suggests that uh, the, the in-hospital mortality provides a more realistic outlook of uh, the perioperative mortality for complex aortic aneurysm repair. But due to the complex risk factor profile of the patients, the increased length of stay, the higher prevalence of complications with prolonged effects, and the advanced critical care uh, that extends the lifespan of the patients in the intensive care unit. I would like to thank you, and I remain at your disposal for any further information. Thank you, Dr. Panagiotopoulos, for your uh, talk, which included a good number of patients in your center, Night Con Hospital. I would like to ask you if uh, you have put any selection criteria or just you just had to operate it on everyone who had a 5.5 centimeter power in aneurysm. Uh, or just you drop out some because uh, you feel that it was very ill or you're just transferred to another center for endo. And what, uh, what is the lesson learned by these uh, good results of uh, 53 patients? Thank you for your questions, uh, Chairman. Uh, well, 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 we have a, a sophisticated and responsible approach on uh, any patient presenting with a, a suprarenal, uh, with a complex aortic aneurysm. Uh, AIDS by itself, it's not a, an exclusive criteria, but uh, all the comorbidities uh, have to, uh, uh, to take in, uh, 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 all, all the comorbidities should be uh, examined in order to, to decide if this patient is candidate for uh, open treatment, for endovascular treatment, or for conservative treatment. Thank you. Is there any other question or comment? Yes. I have a question. Very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, we listen. Um, Ten years ago, I published in the European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery a series of 269 patients who had an arthrobifemoral bypass surgery or aneurysms or plusive disease in an effort to identify prognostic factors for 90 day mortality. This is a well known issue that 30 day mortality does not capture all in hospital deaths. Did you try to identify prognostic factors for? Long term mortality, I mean, after 30 days, like chronic kidney, like CKD, which is an important factor. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't get the question. I didn't hear the question. Uh, he asked you yeah. if you know from the literature if there are prognostic factors who can predict uh, uh, acute and uh, late uh, complications, how you can select. Uh, patients who will uh, have a good outcome. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is um, 
that's the, the meaning of uh, the, the slide about uh, the, the patients. Uh, excuse me, I will put it here. The basis, ba baseline uh, characteristics uh, about these most common uh, comorbidities uh, that um, uh, resulting in a, high, the high risk profile of uh, that kind of operations. And I would also would like to say that uh, nowadays there's um, a worldwide trend uh, on uh, shifting the, the prognosis from uh, for, uh, 30 day mortality to 90 day mortality. Uh, because of what you said, uh, uh, indeed the 30 day uh, mortality does not capture the, the full perioperative mortality in, uh, in complex uh, aortic um, uh, aneurysm repair cases. Yeah, thank you. The question was if you have made an, an association between these risk factors and mortality beyond 30 days. I have, a, I have also a question. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and your uh, great experience. Uh, if I, I, I may, I would like ju just to say a comment uh, first that um, it is very important uh, each center or the center that uh, deals with such kind of patients, either to invest all the efforts and the resources to uh, optimize the open approach, the open surgical approach to uh, treat such cases or to optimize uh, the endo uh, skills and uh, resources uh, in order to treat such patients, uh, uh, expecting that uh, by this way, uh, each center will have the, the, the best results. My question is, in your data, the data you presented us, are these just consecutive patients or is it a matter of selection? In other words, uh, you operated on those patients who had a better uh, profi profile uh, based on their um, uh, uh, comorbidities and you delegated the other patients who had a uh, poor uh, profile to the endovascular uh, uh, treatment. Yes, uh, that's uh, that's true. Uh, it's, uh, it's true that the, the selection uh, for open treatment of uh, jactarenal and suprarenal annuals is uh, shifted to towards the more fit uh, patients for that kind of uh, uh, risky, high risk uh, operation. And uh, also in, on this slide again, there's, the, the, there's this indication where the, the, the patients on the superminal group has, uh, have less uh, comorbidities uh, than the, the patients on, on the jictarinal uh, uh, group. Uh, always uh, open surgery uh, favors the, the patients who are in better clinical condition and uh, that's why uh, the, the unfit patients uh, for open surgery are treated with the endovascular techniques or uh, they are not treated at all. Thank you very much. This is, uh, this is great because I think uh, for the benefit of our patients, we have to select them and to uh, direct them to that particular treatment, which is uh, the best for them. Individualization is very important. <coughs> And we don't have to hesitate to refer the, a, a, an unfit patient to a center which has a, the best uh, endovascular skills and to operate on those patients who can uh, safely sustain an, an open repair. Thank you very much for your uh, answer and thank you very much for the data you present. Okay, thank you. I will move on to the next presentation which will be given by Costas, Dr. Costas Andonopoulos.
Gut. Okay. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to especially thank Professor Yapis. It was an honor and privilege to work with him during the last years. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. So I'm going back to my presentation. This is about complex abdominal aortic aneurysms. So um, complex triple A's include the juxtarenal, the pararenal, the paravisceral, and type 4 thoracoabdominal aneurysms. Of course, we know that there has been an increasing use of more complex endograph designs during the last 20 years, mainly due to fenestrated and branched devices. This is very attractive, especially for the high-risk patients who might not tolerate supraciliac aortic clamping or prolonged visceral and renal ischemia. Of course, mortality is the, is the most commonly reported outcome in studies comparing open with endovascular repair. But we should be aware that there are other unacceptable outcomes, such as the rate of spinal cord ischemia, which are rarely highlighted and they are usually overlooked in the publications. We are all aware that paraparesis and paraplegia reduce the quality of life and have been associated with significantly shortened survival. We know that there are currently no randomized studies, as discussed earlier, and we, we don't have well standardized and homogeneous comparative studies. As a result, there is a lack of high quality evidence in the literature. For that reason, we aimed, we performed a meta-analysis, a systematic review, including all comparative studies, which reported two outcomes, mortality and spinal cord ischemia, after both open and endovascular repair. We also investigated the baseline patient's characteristics among these studies. We included pararenal, juxtarenal, suprarenal, and Crawford type 4 uh, aneurysms. We strictly followed the PRISMA guidelines for this systematic review. This is the flowchart of our study selection. And as you can see, we initially uh, identified more than 700 articles in the literature. And after screening of titles and abstracts and application of exclusion and inclusion criteria, we ended up with eight eligible studies to be included in our meta-analysis. The first finding of this study is that there were major differences in baseline characteristics between the two, the two populations. As you can see this table with red, uh, the red line, you can see that hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, COPD, chronic kidney disease, and ASA score were 1.5 to three times higher in the endovascular group, indicating that the endo group included sicker patients. Then we calculated crude rates for mortality. We found that there was 4.9, almost 5% mortality rate for the, for the open group compared to 4.1 for the endovascular group. This was not statistically significant. Then we performed a meta-analysis, and as you can see in this forest plot, there was not statistically significant difference in the mortality between the two groups among the eight eligible studies. But this was not true for spinal cord ischemia. As you can see in this diagram, crude rates, crude spinal cord ischemia rates uh, were 1.8 for the EVER group compared to only 0.4 for the open group. And this was highly statistically significant. Then we thought that this might change in the meta-analysis after weighting of the studies. But in this forest plot, you will discover that th there was a 3.4 times higher risk for spinal cord ischemia for the endovascular group compared to open. And this was again statistically significant. Then we, we thought about the association of the EVER complexity with spinal cord ischemia rate. We investigated this association. And as you can see in this meta-regression plot, there is a, a, an orange line which shows the mean fence per patient among the eligible studies. Um, as you can see, again, this um, linear increase in the mean number of fence produced this red line, which is an exponential, a polynomial, a very steep increase in the odds of spinal cord ischemia, which shows that when we, we, when we increase the number of fence, then we increase the odds of spinal cord ischemia, 
in, in, the, in the meta-analysis level. But why does this happen? Of course, the etiology is multifactorial. But again, we have some evidence that the liver complexity and probably the coverage of a large proximal aortic seg segment might result in obliteration of the intercostals. And then this could be re responsible for the difference we have shown in our data. In this plot, you will see that the proximal aortic coverage in the open repair, even in type 4 for acuabdominal aneurysms, is just above the celiac artery. However, when we speak about fevers and vivers, then the proximal landing zone is much higher and well, well above the celiac. As a result, we need to cover a larger part of the proximal aorta and the, in order to achieve a proper ceiling, and this might, and, uh, might result to a spinal cord ischemia. But how much of this length should we cover when we do a fan? When we do a fan? Well, this study showed that at least 2.5 centimeters are required above the celiac to have a proper ceiling. And they also suggested that if there is no intercostal pair at this level, then the neck should be maximized at 5 centimeters above the celiac, which is a high level. Again, in, in, in another study, the authors found that th there is a 4 centimeter line above the celiac, which um, defines the high supraceliac uh, coverage level. And this line, coverage above this line, uh, is uh, associated with a high risk of spinal cord ischemia. Well, things are much worse when we speak about, about uh, branch devices. And, and here you can see the T-branch by Cook, which, re which requires 99 millimeters of proximal thoracic aortic, uh, distal thoracic aortic coverage, plus 20 millimeters uh, distance from the origin of the celiac to the end of the celiac branch, which makes a high 120 millimeters above the celiac of coverage. This is also true for other, uh, for other endografts. And even for the newer devices, on the right side, you can see the, the inside uh, graph, graph by Yotek, which has an irreverences and requires at least 93 millimeters of coverage. This is a very interesting study, but the question is that, uh, is this clinically relevant? Well, the, the, the group by uh, Professor Melisano tried to answer this question. And in their study, they found that um, for type 4 for a co-abdominal, there's a high coverage of 125 millimeters above the celiac versus only 13 for the open group. And this was, of course, statistically significant. This was linked, as you can see in the right side of the slide, to a higher uh, increased loss of uh, intercostal arteries uh, coverage between the endovascular and the, um, the, and the open group. These are two cases that came to our attention from other hospitals. On the left side, you can see a patient who had a two-stage uh, complex tripulary repair with uh, continuous aneurysm sac perfusion. And on the right side, you see another patient uh, who had the one-stage uh, complex tripulary repair with complete sac uh, um, exclusion. Both patients developed uh, spinal cord ischemia postoperatively. My conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, is that most series have primarily reported outcomes of only liver and open, and data from comparative studies is lacking. We currently have no randomized control trial, as discussed earlier in the morning. Our meta-analysis found some uh, first evidence that uh, spinal cord ischemia is approximately, three, let's say, more than three times higher in the liver group, group compared to the open surgical repair. We found that atherosclerotic risk factors were much higher in the liver group, which indicated that in this group, uh, this group included high-risk patients. We also found an interesting, an interesting thing that a linear increase, when we uh, slightly increase the number of fans, this might produce a very steep increase in the odds of spinal cord ischemia for liver, and this should be well known to the clinicians. And I think there is a question which is open that should we consult relatively young and fit patients with complex triple A's that spinal cord ischemia should be a factor to be considered when they provide a preference between open surgical repair and EVA? Should we enhance this shared decision making with our patients? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Andonopoulos, for your detailed and in time presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Please, Dr. Uh, Colin. Come. 
I think I think there's some evidence in the literature that it might be beneficial, but I can't say because in our study we didn't have such data, so it's very difficult to, to say from our point of view. But I, I think that it got right at this at this point. Please come here. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Adonopoulos. Very nice and interesting study. Just a comment to Colin before I ask my question. Of course, there is the Papa Artist study run in Germany and uh, we're still participating. I do know there is some unofficial data that this might help indeed, but uh, we're all very interested in seeing whether this uh, selective embolization will finally be the way to we cross our fingers. So now, uh, coming back to your talk, which is really very interesting, I just want to know, because as you nicely mentioned, there is a huge difference between fenestrated and branch grafts, because branch grafts require a higher start, so we close unavoidably uh, more uh, spinal arteries. Uh, did you differentiate, and are you sure that, did you exclude branch devices from this uh, uh, included series or not? Because it's very important, because nowadays, when we started, we used to do fenestrated devices for parallel aneurysms, but uh, there is a tendency around the world to use more and more branch devices, even for almost abdominal aortic aneurysms, because it's easier to do and you have the offset device. So there are many clinicians, uh, even in uh, Central Europe, uh, that uh, prefer to do just a tip branch uh, for a juxtaviral aneurysm. This is a problem as you highlight. Thank you. Um, thank you for this question. It's very, it's very interesting. Um, unfortunately, the original studies did not include separate data for branched and diver devices, and that's a very big problem of the of the current meta analysis. Now we have we're trying to collect some individual patient data about this topic, and I think it might be very, very um, important to to differentiate this uh, to entirely different groups because with fans, uh, the, 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 the the literature says that. You need, uh, let's say, five centimeters, but with branch device, you might end up with uh, 15 or 20 millimeters of the distal thoracic aorta, and this might make a very a, a huge difference. And um, I think your your uh, your observation is very to the point, and I thank you very much for uh, highlighting this. Thank you. Also, Kostas. Yes, the professor. Yes, I have a comment and question. Uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing to the light these particular uh, figures. And I think uh, the most important is for all those who do endovascular repair in uh, complex aneurysms to uh, uh, stress the, the, the attention uh, of the, stress the patient's attention when we take their consent uh, to the fact that there is this uh, uh, risk of uh, paraplegia of neurologic, uh, pro neurologic uh, complications uh, within uh, the other uh, range of uh, possible complications. This is an important issue. Uh, I fully agree with uh, the comment that, uh, and the question that uh, uh, Professor Katsargiris made, because uh, there is a clear difference between the fenestrated and the branched grafts. And um, also one important issue that probably it is not a, it is not a, let's say a, a mistake, but it, it is a defect mistake of yours, but it's a defect in the literature is that um, when we're talking of comparing uh, these two uh, group of patients, we're talking about different group of patients. We know that uh, complications, especially uh, even uh, complications regarding the uh, spinal cord ischemia are very much uh, dependent on to the uh, extent of atherosclerotic disease. And of course, these patients can different, I mean, these two groups can different uh, uh, file of uh, uh, extent of atherosclerotic disease. And that's why uh, we may have a difference in, uh, in this particular complication. My question is, uh, okay, uh, you, you you presented a better um, a better figures in uh, the spinal cord ischemia. What do what do you do 
or if you do anything uh, during the open repair of your open repair of, of um, such annuals in your department in order to optimize or to minimize, uh, in other words, the risk of uh, spinal cord ischemia, do you do anything or is just club and uh, uh, proceed with the repair? When I'm asking what if you do anything, if you do anything for for spinal cord protection. Good, and um, thank you very much for your question. First, I would like to highlight that um, in my meta regression plot, uh, as shown before, uh, we found that the number of fans was uh, exponentially associated with the num with the risk of spinal cord ischemia. So this probably might. Um, Produce some subgroup analysis and answer probably the, the, the previous and your question. Um, concerning the open uh, repair, I think that the, the hemodynamic control of the patient was is one of the most important factors that should be con considered during the operation, and that's why we need the, the collaboration with the with the anesthetists that uh, might produce a very stable patient. I think that this is the most important part of the of the operation. Okay, thank you very much. A uh, short comment is that uh, maybe an issue is that we don't know what is the uh, impact of endolix also of uh, presence of type 2 endolix. Uh, erroneously, it could be supported, it would be protective of such complications, but we don't know anything about it. Okay, we move on on the next. Uh, so, please, Professor Yanukas, go on with. Uh... Thank you very much, Kostas. Uh, it is uh, my great, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Eckstein, uh, Hans uh, Henning Eckstein, who uh, is um, a great friend of mine, and I know that is a greatest friend of uh, Professor Christos Yapis. Professor Eckstein is an international figure. Everybody knows him from his uh, important contribution, not only to the complex aortic aneurysms repair, but also in the carotid artery disease and uh, in peripheral arterial disease. It is a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Eckstein as part of uh, this session. And uh, please, uh, uh, Henning, the, the electronic uh, podium goes to you, the microphone. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Atanasis, for, the, for your very kind words. I mean, it's, maybe it's a bit too much, the honor. But thank you also to George and to the organizers to be part of this um, inaugural uh, Christos Liapis Complex Enrhythm Unit meeting. So it's really a privilege. So thank you very much. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about international variations in endovascular treatment rates of triple A's. These are my disclosures. All of them are unrelated to this talk. I will discuss with you a little bit uh, whether there is any and uh, to which amount we have an extent of international variation in EVA use. Are there any reasons that could be identified for this variation? And what can be done to better balance out the indications and the use of EVA and open surgical repair? The most important source to answer uh, the, the question or the issue of international variation is the International Consortium of Vascular Registries. Sebastian Debos, who talked in the first session, is part of this group. So, and they published, uh, I mean, very insightful papers in circulation 2016 and in the European Journal of Vascular Surgery 2017. And last one just currently 2021, covering more than 100,000 uh, surgeries from 11 countries. And there are two main outcomes, I would say. First is that overall, the percentage of patients undergoing EVA increased. Uh, if you compare different time periods, one 2010 to 16 and the other one bit earlier in blue, 2005 to 2013, and the increase is in the range of 5 to 10 percent. But what you also can see here is that the uptake of EVAR, if you look at Hungary or Denmark, as compared to Australia or the United States, is very different between the countries. That's, uh, that's the first message and the first important information coming from this registry data. 
The other one is that the overall mortality, perioperative mortality decreased from 2 to 1.6%. And that was true. This discrete, this decrease was true for EVAR and for open surgical repair. They give no statistics because that's um, uh, methodologically a bit different, but at least there is an association. And if you look a little bit more in detail, you can see that especially female patients, we talked about that in the, in the first session, elderly patients above 80 years and patients who do not have such a big aneurysm, let's say below six centimeters in diameter, these subgroup of patients do benefit most by use of EVA. With, and if you look at the open surgical outcomes here, octogenarians, nine, more than 9% in hospital mortality. I think this is, or 5% in female patients. This is something that has to be avoided and has to be improved. We look a little bit more in detail, and this is a paper from the British Journal of Surgery from 2018. Uh, and, the, and the authors looked at the uptake of EVAR in England and in Sweden. Sweden started a little bit earlier, 2003 already, and then 12, so it's of course uh, uh, a couple of years ago, but they are in the range of 70 to 80% uptake of EVA for non-ruptured AAA. And the, and the same uh, observation a little bit later uh, could, was, um, was uh, done for England. And if you look in, in this, curves, you can also see that the overall mortality decreased stepwise. So there is also in this more detailed data from England and Sweden, a strong association that EVA leads to better and to decreased in hospital mortality rates. We also looked at some data here from Germany through, together with the Federal Bureau of Statistics. And you see here starting in 2005 for men and women, the uptake increased constantly in some, somewhere in the range between 70 and 80%. In parallel, the in-hospital mortality, again, decreased, especially for male patients, not that much, unfortunately, for um, female patients. This is not EVAR or open surgical repair, it's the whole group. So my conclusions, number one, are that the extent of international variation in EVA use for AAA is significant, that the percentage of patients undergoing EVA for AAA has increased over time, and that the increased use of EVA is associated with a decreased perioperative mortality. So are there any reasons that could be identified for this international variation? Let's have a look a little bit into the countries. A uh, bit difficult to see a paper from 2016 in circulation, but you see these are data from Hungary, Norway, Denmark, Switzerland, Sweden, Australia, United States. And if you and every dot here is one center. So and this picture clearly highlights that even in within the countries there are very, very big differences. Let's look here, for example, Sweden. There are centers who almost never perform EVA for whatever reasons. And there are some of them who almost ever, more than 90% of the patients perform EVA. So within the centers, uh, uh, significant and really uh, um, um, extensive differences are observable. And the same again, takes place in Germany. This is an ana analysis where we looked at the uptake in the different counties, not in the states, but one level below in, in the German administratory counties. And what you see that is the EVA percentage again varies between 48 and 93%. So obviously center um, uh, preferences and especially surgeon preferences uh, play a dominant role. Another point is that the guidelines give us a little bit different uh, recommendation. The ESVS two years ago re recommended that in most patients with suitable anatomy, 
and reasonable life expectancy, EVA should be considered as the preferred treatment modality. And that in patients with very long life expectancy or younger patients, open repair should be considered uh, because of the better long term data. A little bit different, the NICE Institute in the UK recommended very recently that open surgical repair for people with unruptured triple A's greater than 5.5 centimeter should be performed unless it's contraindicated because of their abdominal co-pathology, anesthetic risks, and or medical comorbidities. And for those patients with abdominal co-pathology, EVA should be considered. And for all other patients with medical comorbidities, higher uh, overall risk, etc., EVA or conservative conservative management should be considered. So NICE is very strong leaning to more open surgical repair due to the bad or the worst long term data, especially in the UK studies. And the ESVS is a little bit more on the endovascular side. And the third point is that the reimbursement within the different healthcare system might also play a role. This is an analysis from 2016. In black, you see countries with a so-called fee-for-service reimbursement um, system, and uh, in white countries with what they called a population-based reimbursement model or a state organized healthcare system sometimes. And uh, what, you, what you see is that um, the, the fee for service countries uh, more often use EVA as compared to the other ones, at least there's a tendency. And if you look here at the proportion of small aneurysms with a maximum diameter less than 5.5 centimeters, that especially we in Germany, uh, tend to treat more patients with so-called small aneurysm. So uh, the, the idea is, or what we can learn from this analysis is that the reimbursement system might also play a role in the selection for patients for EVA or open surgical repair. So conclusions number two, there is a big variation within countries and within regions. Uh, center and surgeon related preferences vary significantly. And I put that in bold because I think that's the most important uh, variable. Guideline recommendations vary and what and are not very specific when it comes to anatomical suitability. And the reimbursement system within the different countries may also have an influence on patient selection. So my last point, what can be done to better balance the indications for EVA and open surgical repair? Well, we talked about that in the first session. Uh, I think really think that centralization is key. Uh, that should not mean in every country that we create a situation like in London where there are four or five centers for a population of more than 12 million people. But uh, if we look at the situation in Germany, for example, uh, we really have more than 500 hospitals that treat AAA. Uh, and that is something that is not very good for the patient. And there are tons of data really that uh, high volume centers have better outcomes due to the inverse volume outcome relationship. And as I mentioned in the first session, Training for the future vascular surgeon is, is, I think it's essential for our specialty and it's essential for patients and referring physicians that they can rely on well trained vascular surgery able to manage triple A's by conservative, open, or endovascular means. And emergency cases and EVAR is clearly better in suitable patients for ruptured triple A. Uh, how should we really, how can we provide emergency EVA if we don't have enough experience in elective EVA? So centralization is key. Another important point is that, of course, financial incentives, uh, e.g. from and fee for service, healthcare reimbursement systems are 
not optimal, I would say. You know, and in addition, uh, any competition between medical specialties, e.g. vascular surgeons and interventional radiologists or cardiologists or whomsoever, uh, should be avoided. Uh, AAA is something that belongs to vascular surgeons. It's one of our key competence and that uh, should be uh, realized. So thank you very much in, uh, again for the invitation and thank you, Christos, especially what you've done for vascular surgery in Greece, but also on the European level. I would like to remind all of you that Christos was one of those key vascular surgeons, uh, I would say, who were able to uh, create the, the section of vascular surgery within the UAMS which meant that we uh, stepped up to an independent uh, specialties, head, uh, head to head to uh, visceral surgery and all the other surgical and other medical specialties. And that was not only politically, it was a very, very important step for vascular surgery in all European countries. Thank you also, Chris, for your personal friendship I will never forget this fantastic trip to the Meteora four years ago. And thank you for supporting my meeting. And that's my last slide. Everybody is, of course, very, very welcome to the hybrid meeting, the 10th Munich, Vas Munich Vascular Conference early in December this year. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Henning, for a very interesting and very um, intelligent presentation, which actually shows what is happening, uh, not only in Europe, but in its country as well, regarding the variation in the management of um, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, just um, uh, help me uh, if I would like to ask uh, whether there are any questions from the room. Costas, please, if there is any question from the room, can you call the colleagues to come and uh, make their questions to Professor Eckstein? Costas, open your microphone. <laughs> Costas, I, 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 cannot, I cannot hear you. Open your microphone. Costas, Professor Phyllis, Professor Phyllis, open your microphone. We cannot hear you. Microphone. Maybe you have to repeat the question. Uh, excuse me. The question, the microphone uh, was, was shut, Costas. Are you hearing you were, me? You were muted. Probably not. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. You are on mute. Uh, Professor Eckstein? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Kostas Filis from Athens, Greece, from the Amphitheater. Uh, what is the impact of the, uh, the German society? I'm aware that uh, has adopted prediction models and has suggested that uh, some prediction models would uh, help, such as the BAR, uh, the British aneurysm scoring system. Would you think that uh, prediction models can uh, help? <clears throat> I'm not, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's the German society's uh, recent guidelines. Yeah, uh, we, uh, the German Vascular Society uh, runs a, um, a, risk, a, a registry on AAA treatment, but this is voluntary. Uh, around 120 clinics take part in this registry covering, let's say, 30 to 40, maximum 40% of all AAAs treated in Germany. And my guess is that the clinics that are more interested to have some sort of benchmarking so to, to compare their results with the other clinics in the registry are interested. And all the other ones who do uh, 10 or 15 cases a year or 20, let's say, uh, are not that much interested to take that part, uh, that registry. So this is a weak point, I would say, of any analysis from the German aortic registry. However, Thomas Schmitz-Rixen put, 
analyzed the data for a couple of years now, and he believes that he has a scoring system that might help clinicians to um, stratify the patients better in, in terms of high risk or lower risk patients. Um, personally, I'm I'm not that much a fan of uh, these scoring systems because um, it depends on so many other variables. Uh, the outcomes depend on so many variables, and the indication has also uh, risk, has also to respect the um, patient's preference and uh, and the patient's uh, the patient's um, um, perspective whether or not a AAA should be treated. So uh, it is clear we know that. Uh, COPD and renal insufficiency, age, especially for open repair, uh, PAD and, and some others, uh, lower ejection fraction, et cetera, are associated with higher risk for either therapy. But I, I'm, a, I'm really, I, I, I love to talk to the patients, to take my time, to offer them the alternatives, and then to to have a very much individualized decision about that. Okay, thank you. Your message was clear, uh, Doctor. I don't know we can move on. No other. Is, is there is there any question? No. Uh, before we move on, just a, a last question from me, uh, Henning. Uh, I agree with you that uh, there are a lot of uh, variables that uh, may. Move the decision to one or the other direction, and as you said, as you said, uh, it is uh, pretty multifactorial. Just your your input. Do you believe that um, the introduction of artificial intelligence could uh, probably help us in future by just adding all these multiple variables in a model that could actually help us? Of, uh, of course, I have to admit that artificial intelligence will not replace the human mind, mm -hmm. but may be very helpful. Just your 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 uh, your vision. Well, I I do have some fantasy that uh, AI will help us a little bit in the future. Um, especially, I do think that uh, special anat anatomies treated already. And long-term outcomes could be better um, could be better inserted and better addressed in in such a complex mathematical artificial intelligence system. But uh, future will tell. I mean, we uh, I think Stefan Alon already worked through this sort of um, decision-making system for patients' surveillance after Riva. Um, and there are some data coming up, but uh, I'm optimistic that this will help us a little bit. But as you said, the personal interaction and assessment will not be replaced by that, at least not in the next 10 years, I would say. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Henning. It was great, uh, your, your presentation and your uh, uh, contribution to this particular discussion. Thank you very much. And please allow me to move to the next uh, speaker. Who is a, a close friend of mine, Colin Bickner, from uh, Imperial College, uh, London, UK. Colin Bickner, Bickner is a well known um, vascular surgeon who has a great experience in dealing with uh, complex aneurysms. Colin? Uh, sorry, Mr. Eckstein, could you please stop sharing your, your slides, please? Uh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, I try to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, where is the button? There is a button on the left. On the left, okay. Excuse me very much. Well, what I what I do is. Um, 
for some reason. I don't, I cannot find that. If you could move the point, your pointer to the top of the screen, then the button will appear. Yeah, that should be the case, but it's, I don't know why it's not the case anymore. Uh, all right, I do it, I do it, I take the hard way. There's a button that says stop sharing. The button that says stop sharing. You... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now I got it. Um... Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. Check okay. It. That's okay. Is uh, is Colin with us? Yeah. Okay. Colin. The, the microphone is yours. I don't know whether you have uh, listened to my introduction. Yep. Thank you. It's a privilege to speak at this symposium with such distinguished speakers, of course. It's an honor, Chris Yapos. Um, but it's also a privilege for me because I came to visit the, the unit here um, over the last 24 hours and join in with the MDT and the ward round. And, and uh, it's a wonderful achievement that you've done since that first operation we saw in 2008, uh, Professor Liapos and P P Professor Gerilakis. Uh, I'm going to talk to you, though, about hostile proximal mechs over the next 10 minutes. These are my disclosures. So the horsemen of the apocalypse have been rather busy over the last two years with coronavirus and Iraq and all the other things that are happening in the world. But what you don't know is that there are also four necks of the apocalypse at the short, angulated, conical and wide necks. And what I'm going to talk about is each of these necks in turn, what that means in terms of results, and also some of the ways that we might treat them traditionally, and also some of the new technologies that are coming across. Uh, in farina endographs in short necks, we, it's probably well accepted that you can get a seal in the short term, but in the long term, these patients don't fare well. I've just picked out one paper of many in the literature from Bologna looking at 60 patients with short necks. There is uh, a, a 10, over 10, over five years, there's a 10% type 1A endo leak as these endographs fail uh, when the neck is less than seven centimeters, seven millimeters. What's also interesting is that in, within the EVAR1 trial, where patients were inside IFU, the neck length still made a difference. So it's not like there's a, maximum, a minimum neck length that you need to use. It, it, the neck length is very important all the way. And that's borne out, of course, in our clinical experience way back in 2009. This patient had a, a short neck of uh, between eight and 10 millimeters had an endograft with an initial seal, which failed, treated then with a palmas and an extension and failed again. And this patient within, by 2012, had what he should have had in the first place, which is a more proximal repair. For conical and wide necks, the story is much the same. It's easy to get a seal, but over the long term, these necks will fail. This is Stefan's uh, group's paper, uh, which is recent. This is for the fourth generation graphs in over 100, 100 patients. There is a 12% proximal type 1 endo leak rate at two years with these wide necks, and by wide, you define them as more than 28 millimetres. There's also a 3% migration risk, so we haven't solved migration either. We've looked at migration uh, more carefully in, uh, in our series of patients. This is ours and uh, some patients from Coventry. Out of 241 cases, there's 50 cases that m tilt or migrate to some degree, if you measure it very carefully. And it's imminently associated with increased neck diameter 
and change in net diameter as well as aneurysm size. An angulated neck, disappointed to say, I, I, I rather hope that as long as you have a long neck, if the angulation shouldn't make any difference because you should be able to get a seal and healthy and healthy aorta, which didn't degenerate over time. But it's not true. Uh, if you look at these patients long enough with angulated necks, this is in patients with, with fairly adequate length necks, there is a failure rate which keeps on coming after two or three years. So all these necks seem to fail quite quickly. So what do we do about them? Well, I'll deal with open surgery first because I think it's most important. There is still a place for open surgery, I'm sure, in these patients, uh, probably in screening patients where the anatomy is not perfect in under 70s uh, and where connective tissue disease or other pathologies are involved, but also in these hostile, but definitely in these hostile necks. And I'll remind you that the, the results for open surgery aren't that bad. We've seen a few times uh, uh, results from open surgery, and I'll just illustrate them again. Before the advent of FIVAR and BVAR, um, selected uh, case series showed a, a 2 or 3% mortality for these juxtarenal cases. Of course, there's these, some patients are turned down in this series, but, uh, but there's still good results. At the other end of the spectrum, if you don't want to offer someone aneurysm surgery, uh, most people would agree that uh, extending the landing zone up and over the renals and celiac artery with a fenestrated branch graft or a chimney graft is the right thing to do. There's good evidence. This is BSET registry data, the British Society of Endovascular Therapy, that over a number of years, the mortality is low, the reintervention rate isn't too bad, and you can get a really good result if your anatomy is good. Chimneys uh, are divide the vascular uh, community, as we know, but there are some good studies, uh, the, uh, such as these, um, which show that if you do it right and follow the rules for, for chimneys and you uh, stick to strict anatomical criteria and you are experienced and know about them, uh, then you can get some good results. But what is really interesting at the moment in this field of hostile necks is actually some of the new infrarenal technologies which might deal with some of these patients. I'll deal with endo anchors first, they've been around for the longest. They um, are a series of helical anchors which, can, which are uh, designed to fix the aortic endograph to the aortic wall below the level of the renal arteries in these cases. Uh, and they seem to establish a strong, uh, strong bond and, and establish the strength of a sutured anastomosis. If you look at ex vivo studies with distraction forces trying to pull the graphs out, it seems that the endoanchors may mechanically resist neck dilatation. There's some, there's uh, really nice experimental evidence looking at this. And also Professor Tassiopoulos from um, Stony Brook uh, next to New York has shown that actually one of the factors that uh, protects against neck dilatation over one or two years is that of um, placing more than eight endo anchors in the neck. And the other nice thing about endoanchors is that it promotes uh, increased sac regression. Uh, it seems to be that in the anchor registry and it seems to be that in um, propensity analyses. And so the anchor registry is the best evidence that we will get for um, uh, using endoanchors at the moment, I think. Uh, in the anchor registry, the primary arm, that's anchors put in at the, at the time of the index procedure, there are hostile necks in 88.8% .8 of these uh, patients as judged by a, a certain criteria. And there's good long-term survival and freedom from type 1 endoleak rates. So they're useful probably in the conical and wide necks, most of all, and maybe even the angulated necks. For angulated necks specifically, uh, the, the, the new kid on the block is the ball excludable conformable uh, system, but with active control. So this graft allows you to uh, either um, 
angulate the top end of the graft when it's collapsed or when it's half open so that you can place the graft in angulated necks exactly below the level of the renal arteries and utilize that whole neck length. If you can utilize that whole neck length, your long-term outcome should be better. Uh, we are currently uh, in the British Society of Endovascular Therapy running a device registry with Gore. Um, it's uh, primarily to evaluate the aortic neck co coverage and look at results over one year. With Specifically with this device, the registry has been hit hard by coronavirus, but is recruiting actually rather well at the moment. We've up to 87 patients, uh, and that's got to the rest of the year to, to recruit. Uh, hostile necks, perhaps, uh, which are wide and conical, but also those with thrombus and calcification. The endologic autograph is interesting. Uh, it's a polymer based um, uh, seal at the top, which provides a seal seven millimeters below the renal arteries, but of course, we need a 13 millimeter or more neck length to place it in. It's purported to be a very good graph for these. Um, types of neck and the data that endologics are pr pr producing for long-term type 1a endolink rates in wide necks is very interesting it's quite impressive and i think there's more of the story to come so then what does that mean for our clinical practice there's an awful lot of options that we have and i i I'll, I've put this up as, a, as, as an example, but I, I, there is an awful lot of overlap. There are an awful lot of patients that are suitable for one, but not the other device. And it, it is a matter of debate. It's not clear. There is no perfect algorithm for these patients, but there are lots of options. And so it does mean that we can tackle different situations uh, based on anatomy, physiology, and surgeon and, ex and center experience. For more evidence, um, a randomised controlled trial between surgery and fenestrated may never come because I'm not sure enough people have equipoise. Put that out there. In the UK, we have uh, a large study uh, looking at um, registry data along with anatomical data in the UK Compass study uh, run by Raoul Vanapanani in, in Liverpool, which hopefully will give us some really good evidence about the pros and cons of each. Technique. So I think uh, key points in the future, there is an evidence gap that needs filling uh, for all of these new uh, end of endovascular devices that are coming out. I think there's more technologies, both ones we know about and new after gardens that are on their way, which are going to be very interesting. But my bottom line is that complementary, these therapies are complementary. We should use our experience, anatomy and physiology to decide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Holly. Very interesting your presentation. And I think the hostile proximal neck is uh, something which is a, a, a real problem and a nightmare sometimes for all vascular surgeons dealing with complex uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, Professor Phyllis, is there any question before I do my question? Uh, uh, is there a question from the room? Uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm sorry to say that we're a little late, so my sister needs to go on, If uh, except if you have the chairman any question. Hey, Professor Kakos? Yes, Colin, congratulations for this very nice talk. It was very informative. Hello. Based on reporting standards back in 1991, the definition of a, of a JAXA renal triple A is determined by the length of the neck that should not exceed one centimeter. Now that we have the auto graph that requires seven millimeters minimum coverage length, shall we change the definition of a JAXA renal replay? Thank you. That's a really difficult question. And the definition of a juxtarine lanurism has been thrown around by open surgeons and endovascular specialists to mean a host of different things. In the, in the open surgical world, I've always considered it, if your clamp is above the renal arteries and your anastomosis is below you, that's a juxtarine lanurism. But now we have to worry, now we have to make a decision about uh, anatomical 
Uh, most people uh, are now steering away from the term juxta renal and talking about off IFU, which I think is 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 a bit of a cop out. Probably, um, probably less than a, a centimetre is it would be very, fairly well accepted if you mooted it to the vascular community. But I don't honestly think the terms are entirely useful. But there is a need for us to to, to study like with like when we're cons when we're considering open surgery versus fever and and these different technologies that keep coming out. And now is the time to make some decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleague, just a quick, quick question. Do you think that we have to move from the idea of a, of a hostile neck uh, from doing a standard EVA to uh, a, a more um, uh, um, techniques like a fenestrated or uh, a BIVAR endograft in order to go uh, to have a landing area in the more healthy aorta? So I think that uh, that question is um, is difficult, isn't it, for each individual patient? It depends really what you want. If you want, uh, if you if if you have a sixty five year old man who is perfectly fit and healthy with a one centimeter or less neck, you probably are going to opt for surgical repair for that long term durability. If the anatomy is perfect and and these this person has had a recent coronary stent or other uh, comorbidity, but they look like they're going to uh, do well and, and have a number of years to live. I would probably stay away from those new technologies and go for the fenestrative and, and, and branch device for because I think you'll get a longer, better lasting repair. But on the other hand, uh, uh, if there is uh, for a, for a wider a conical neck, the endo anchors are a really good solution and with further evidence your your confidence might increase into treating these uh, perhaps if they d are shown consistently to reduce neck dilatation and and, and stop that that uh, late type 1a endo leak and certainly for for sort of patients or definitely older patients with tender symptomatic aneurysms who don't need as long a lasting repair there's a really good option some of these and i really like the new or um, active control graft. I think we've got a number of years to see whether that that uh, that beautiful placement that you get with a highly angulated neck in good healthy mix makes uh, is is um, it gives you long term outcome benefits. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your presentation and your participation in uh, the questions. Uh, I would like to pass the microphone to Professor Phyllis. Oh, to, sorry, to Professor uh, Kakos, in order to make the introduction of the next three speakers. Professor Kakos. Open your microphone, Professor Kakos. Microphone, you are muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Professor Giannoukas. The next speaker is Professor John Kakisis from Aticon General Hospital, University Hospital in Athens, and more specifically from the Professor Liapis unit on complex aneurysms, who is going to present us the value of biological context <coughs> for the management of infected aortic processes, and more specifically, the experience of his unit. Thank you. John. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, uh, according to the oath of uh, Hippocrates, you must consider dear to you as your parents, him who taught you this art, the art of vascular surgery in our case. And uh, for me, this person is uh, Professor Yapis. Uh, and this is an opportunity for me to express my gratitude to him once again. The ESVS 2020 Clinical Practice Guidelines on the Management of Vascular Graft Infections recommend complete excision of all graft uh, material uh, and infected tissue for definitive treatment. The question is, how will you restore the perfusion of the lower limbs? And uh, in general, there are two uh, options, in-line reconstruction and uh, extra-anatomic uh, bypass. And uh, there are three options for in-line reconstruction. 
the cryopreserved allo graft, uh, the nice procedure, and uh, the prosthetic uh, graft. And uh, when we say prosthetic uh, graft, uh, we don't mean a plain uh, PTFA or Dacron graft because uh, these grafts uh, have a very poor long term uh, survival. Uh, we mean uh, either antibiotic soaked uh, grafts uh, or silver coated uh, grafts. Uh, None of these techniques uh, is uh, ideal. Uh, you can see early mortality rates uh, of up to 45%, late mortality rates uh, of up to uh, 85%, uh, amputation rates uh, of up to 27%, graft occlusion rates of up to 37.2%, reinfection 27%, and graft or stamper rupture of up to 27%. Uh, it seems that the autologous uh, vein uh, offers the best uh, results, and that is why the SVS uh, 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 guidelines uh, say that uh, in situ reconstruction with autologous vein should be considered as the preferred uh, method. Uh, whereas uh, cryopreserved allografts, uh, silver coated grafts, rifabicin bonded polyester grafts, or bovine pericardium should be considered as alternative solutions. Partial excision may be considered when uh, in, uh, infection is documented as limited and the remaining material is well incorporated, whereas extra anatomic reconstructions, reconstruction may be considered for patients with a large abscess or multi-resistant uh, microorganisms. Uh, the NICE procedure was described for the first time by Claggett in 1993. Uh, here you can see the harvesting of the femoral, femoral popliteal uh, uh, vein. The deep uh, femoral vein, the, the profunda femoris uh, vein, uh, has to be preserved. And there are several ways uh, of doing the proximal anastomosis, end-to-end, -end, uh, or conjoint uh, veins uh, uh, anastomosed uh, uh, then uh, to the uh, proximal aorta, or conjoint uh, veins uh, anastomosed uh, on the anterior aspect of the overshone aortic uh, stump. And there are several configurations uh, for the nice uh, for the for the graft uh, bifurcated uh, aorta unilateral with a femoral femoral uh, bypass uh, or uh, auto left femoral uh, bypass with a right femoral limb or semi nice uh, procedures when where uh, an infected auto by femoral graft limb is replaced. Uh, advantages of a nice procedure include the fact that uh, autogenous uh, femoral popliteal vein grafts have large caliber, are uh, infection resistance, uh, non thrombogenic surface, low incidence of developing vein graft stenosis and aneurysmal degeneration. Venous physiology is minimally disturbed and the problem of aortic stamp blowout is eliminated. Disadvantages include the fact that the NICE procedure is long, technically demanding, may require two teams, and uh, venous grafts uh, may be disrupted by highly virulent pathogens, including gram-negative microorganisms, MRSA, or candida species. These are the theoretical advantages and disadvantages, and this is uh, how uh, the autologous uh, vein performs in uh, practice. Over the past uh, five years, in the Department of Vascular Surgery uh, of the Atticon University Hospital, hospital uh, we performed uh, 13 NICE uh, procedures, seven uh, with bifurcated uh, grafts, uh, three semi-NICE, and three with bovine pericardium. And we had uh, two perioperative uh, deaths, one of which was because of aspiration pneumonia and the other one because of graft uh, disruption. And we had another infection-related death four months after the operation. So the perioperative mortality was 15% and the one-year mortality 23%. In this series of uh, 187 uh, NICE uh, procedures by Ali and Associates, uh, the procedure-related mortality was 14%, uh, fasciotomy 25%, and amputation rate 7.4%. We didn't have such uh, complications in our uh, series. This is one of our uh, nice uh, procedures, the harvesting of the femoropopliteal vein. Uh, the veins are then uh, shown together to uh, form a bifurcated graft, and this is uh, the final uh, result. This is a uh, Lazarus uh, a procedure, a procedure performed by Lazarus. Uh, and uh, this is another case uh, where a graft uh, to the uh, right uh, renal artery uh, had, uh, was required because uh, the, was the aneurysm was pararenal. This 
was a 67-year-old male uh, who had undergone EVAR five years before. Then he presented with prostatitis. Uh, bacterial culture, both in urine and blood, revealed uh, Serichia coli. Then he suffered from acute ischemia of the left limb. He had a ventrombectomy of the left limb of the endograft. And then he developed uh, abdominal pain and fever, and the CTA uh, demonstrated an abscess in front of the left iliac artery and uh, the aorta. Uh, the patient uh, was taken to the operating room, and then a nice procedure uh, was uh, performed. One month uh, later, he came back with pain, with fever and fatigue. Urine culture revealed Klebsiella, blood culture candida albicans, and the CTA showed disruption of the right limb of the nice and uh, the left iliac anastomosis. Uh, these were treated with uh, covered uh, stents. This is the final uh, angiogram. Two months later, the patient came back uh, again with uh, fever. He was taken to the operating room where uh, our enteric fistula was uh, found. The graft uh, was uh, excised and the next anatomic uh, bypass uh, and axillo bifemoral graft was uh, placed. Uh, the patient eventually died uh, of uh, multi-organ uh, failure. Uh, in this series that I have already shown you, there were uh, five uh, cases of uh, graft uh, disruption. Uh, four of these uh, cases, uh, in four of these cases, uh, microbiology of the excised uh, graft disclosed the uh, candida albicans, and uh, this was the same uh, in our case, uh, candida albicans. I uh, would comment on that later on again. And uh, this is another patient uh, with an autobifemoral uh, graft uh, infection. Uh, we treated him with a uh, bovine pericardium. Uh, we first would create uh, the two tubes. We shoot them together to form a bifurcated graft. The length uh, of the bovine pericardium patch is uh, 25 centimeters. Uh, here we needed uh, a 30 centimeter long uh, graft. So we had to add, to add uh, a main uh, body. Uh, Professor Eckstein is doing it in another uh, way. Uh, the main uh, body and the ipsilateral limb is in one piece, and then he adds uh, the contralateral uh, limb. Uh, this is the final result in our patient. And uh, this is uh, the microbiology of the excised uh, graft. You can see a uh, multisensitive Staphylococcus epidermidis, and this is probably why this patient did so well. Uh, however, this patient did not do so well. Uh, this was a patient with uh, an autoenteric uh, fistula. Uh, he was treated again with uh, bovine pericardium, a uh, graft made of bovine pericardium. But nine days after the operation, there was graft uh, disruption and the patient died. Uh, uh, culture of both the duct and graft and the bovine pericardium disclosed candida albicans once again. So instead of a conclusion, I will show you what the ESVS guidelines uh, say. Autologous veins have uh, the lower infection rate, 0 to 6%, and low graft thrombosis rates. In our series, we had the 10% uh, infection rate and no case of graft thrombosis. Disadvantages include harvesting difficulties in the emergency setting and a lower operation time so that it, it may not be tolerated by elderly patients with comorbidities. Previous deep vein thrombosis is a contraindication. Harvesting veins is associated with venous morbidity with chronic venous insufficiency reported in up to 15% and deep vein thrombosis in up to 22%. We didn't have any case of venous morbidity in our series. Venous grafts might be effective for highly virulent pathogens, but their use in multi-resistant strains remains unclear. There are reports of poor outcomes in the presence of gram-negative microorganisms, MRSA or candida species, especially when concomitant sepsis or our enteric fistula exist. And our series is yet to another, another report uh, showing poor outcomes in patients with uh, candida albicans. And this is a picture of me with four members of my family, my wife, my two children, and Professor Yatis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kakisis. Are there any comments from the participants, please? There is one from uh, Professor Lazarus. Sure. Uh, 
Uh, congratulations all for a great presentation because really uh, I think we heard everything about this uh, entirety. I just would like to to ask your opinion uh, whether uh, the etiology of infection should be taken under consideration, uh, whether it is uh, just a simple infection of the graft or is after uh, or together with an auto and direct fistula. So if you take, should we change, should it, it would change your way of going on. Thank you. Well, a, a, a simple graft infection, especially if it is uh, uh, in the long term, uh, frequently is because of uh, Staphylococcus uh, epidermidis. And uh, this is a, a low virulence uh, uh, microorganism. So, uh, an autologous uh, vein or any, any, any uh, biological conduit uh, will most probably perform well. Uh, in patients with an autoenteric fistula, uh, you will most probably have uh, several uh, microorganisms involved, uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria, most certainly, uh, maybe candida albicans, as in our case. Uh, so this is a highly uh, virulent environment, and biological uh, conduits uh, may not perform uh, so well. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? If not, for the sake of time. Just okay. Uh, have a lot of experience. Can you differentiate the patients who you choose to ligate the aorta and do a next or bypass? Uh, well, I will take uh, many factors uh, in mind. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, if I, I can create a good stamp. If the proximal anastomosis is uh, very close to the renal arteries, we may not be able to create a good stamp. Uh, whereas if you have an orthobifemoral bypass uh, placed for an uh, orthoiliac uh, occlusive disease with an end-to-side anastomosis, you will more, most probably be able to, to create a good stamp. Uh, the age of the patients is another factor uh, for an extra anatomic, in favor of an extra anatomic uh, bypass. Uh, then, uh, uh, if I uh, have an orthobifemoral graft, uh, which has to be taken off, uh, can be completely excised, uh, then uh, you cannot place an uh, actual bifemoral bypass in the femoral, uh, an infected femoral uh, region. Uh, another factor is uh, whether the femoral uh, arteries are of, of good quality with a good uh, patency. Uh, if they are heavily calcified, then an extra, an extra anatomic uh, bypass may not work uh, well. So uh, I will take very, many, many factors uh, in mind. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So we can now move thank on you. to the next speech. It's actually going to be a video presentation by Professor Moulakakis on the retroperitoneal approach for the open surgical repair, juxta renal and supra renal aneurysm, Costas. So, good morning, dear chairman. I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to take part and participate in this very interesting uh, event. I also would like to congratulate Professor Yapis for his achievements, for his contribution in the vascular society, and also for being a mentor for me in my career. So I'm going to show you now a video uh, describing the retroperitoneal reconstruction of a suprarenal aneurysm. So we will start now the video. And I'm going to start with Regarding the position of the patient, let's go start with this. Thank you. Okay, it's okay. Just, no, 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 share it. So, uh, I'm going to show you now the video regarding the retroperitoneal approach for the open surgical repair for Jack Sarena, suprarenal 
And I will start with the position of the patient. As you can see here, the patient is playing with a big back. The shoulders are positioned at 60 degrees, and also the hips are positioned at 45 or 60 degrees. This is to achieve a better uh, place of the patients. You see that the left arm is rotated to the patient's right in order to avoid the damage of the plexus nerve. We use the break of the table in order to increase the space between the 12 ribs. And this is the incision that we normally do, an oblique incision which is made from below the umbilicus to the tip of the 11th rib. Uh, the incision can be extended in the 10th intercostal space. Some uh, physicians, they also suggest that the 10th uh, uh, can, can be also totally resected. And the longer posterior the incision, the exposure of the aorta. Uh, you can see how, how we start the surgery with the incision. It starts in the lateral port of the rectus muscle and is extending obliquely. You see that the subcutaneous tissue uh, is divided into exposed the anterior fascia of the external oblique muscle. We use the electrocautery so as not to have bleeding. And we will proceed with the division of the musculature. We will start first with the external oblique, then with the internal oblique muscle, and then with the transverse abdominalis fascia. You can see here that we start from the lateral board of the rectus muscles, and then we proceed obliquely. So we pay very much attention not to to lose blood. We use the cell saver, and now you can see the characteristic yellow preperitoneal fat. Now we use this maneuver to, to dissect and to prepare the retroperitoneal space. We can use a spoke stick or blood dissections with uh, our fingers. We start from the, from, the, from the part of the rectus muscles, and then we proceed laterally, and then, and then cephalat. You can see here that uh, we are very cautious not to open the peritoneal cavity. And then you can see here the psoas muscle. We will proceed by preparing the anterior uh, border of the, of the muscles. And then subsequently, you, subsequently we will found the ureter. You see that we have started preparing the aneurysm. Uh, we're, we have started uh, moving medially the peritoneal cavity. And now we will see the ureter. The ureter can be left in situ or can be slightly mobilized and looped with this elastic loop. Uh, then you will see that we will start uh, moving on in the cephala the proximal way. You see that with the finger we show the ureter. At this point we use a self-retraining retractor system. And now you can see that we started preparing the outer neck. So the left renal artery is identified. There are two veins, the renal arbor vein and also the ascending larval vein that should be identified and ligated in order to avoid, to avoid MRS during surgery. Also, we, use, we will use calculation near the renal artery to, to cut and also to ligate uh, small lymphatics. And then we will proceed with the, with the... You can see here that there are three tips that should be considered. The first one is that uh, we use blood dissection with our fingers to prepare the aorta at the level of the healthy neck. Uh, some physicians, they also propose that the aorta can be circumferentially prepared. It's something that we normally would, would not do. And the third one tip is that if space cephala approximately, we have to cut the cruise of the diaphragm. This is what we do specially and particularly when we have an annulus which is extended at the level of the SMA or the celiac artery. Here you can see the healthy aorta and the right renal artery. Uh, and now we still insist of preparing clearly the aortic neck. And now we will start preparing uh, distally the two iliac arteries. You can see here the left and the left and the right uh, iliac artery. This is the incision that we perform. This is below the left renal artery. A single dose of 5,000 using has been administered. And then we perform the suprarenal clamping. We attempt to clamp once and cleanly to avoid thrombus or heavily calcified plaques. 
Then we move on in the iliac arteries. If an aneurysm in the right iliac artery is also uh, extended annual in the right leg artery, a low right quadrant uh, above, above one centimeter of the inguinal ligament can be performed to prepare also the external iliac artery. Here you can see that we have opened the annual sac. We prepare the proximal and the distal anastomosis. We will reset, we will reset completely the thrombus. Uh, you can see also the ostium of the right renal artery from inside. <clears throat> Sorry. You can see that the aorta is a little bit sagged at the level of the anastomosis. This is something that we have to consider during the anastomosis. And uh, then we will start the anastomosis. The anastomosis can be performed by three ways, by three options. There are three options. The one option is to, 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 to do it with a parachute technique. The second option is to start from the nine and the three hour to, to proceed to the 12 and the six hour. And the third option is what we perform to start and to go to 12 o'clock bilateral. So you can see here, we have, uh, first we have done the right side of the anastomosis. Now we put the last stitches. We try to have no leak between the stitches. And uh, this is the last stitch. After the last stitch, we normally do the anastomosis with 3-0 polypropylene uh, stitch, which is a uh, non-absorbable stitch and uh, you can see here that we will proceed with the declamping of the of the of the aorta you see the declamping there the, the air is declamping a flash of the aorta and then the clamp is moved below renals and the uh, anastomosis. The time of this anastomosis was approximately 16 minutes. It's something that will be measured and we have in consideration. And then you see here the two iliac costumes. We try to, to take out some debris of thrombus from the iliac uh, vessels. And uh, now we will proceed with the cut of the graft and with the distal anastomosis. Uh, we perform the distal anastomosis in the same way. We start in the six hour and we proceed bilaterally from both sides. And uh, you can see here that uh, we use also the 3-0 polypropylene stitch. We perform the end-to-end -end anastomosis and then at the end we will inspect the two iliac vessels to see their good patency and this is the final result. Uh, we are performing a good hemostasis. As I said, we use the cell safer. And now the wound closure is facilitated by flattening the table. Uh, the retroperitoneum usually is not drained. And if the left side of the chest had been entered, then a pleural or catheter is being placed. Uh, after insufflation of the lungs and evacuation of air, the catheter is removed. All alternatively, we can put a chest tube, which can remain in the pleural cavity for in the next day. Uh, so this is the closure of the patient and uh, the total time was approximately 3 hours and 10 minutes. So this video was performed with the participation of vascular surgeons in the University Hospital and I would like to thank in this operation Dr. Lagos and Andreas Lazaris for helping me in doing this operation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, Kostas. I have a question regarding the frequency of the need to enter the pleural cavity, to enter the chest. Could you tell us a little bit about this, please? Uh, unfortunately, Professor Kagos, I didn't hear your question. You, you, you said something about yes. the pleural cavity. And entering the chest. Did you hear how, something? How often? More loudly. Yes, uh, can you speak more loudly? You said something yes. about the pleural cavity. Could you please speak a little more loudly? How often do you need to enter the chest and what are the indications to do so? Did somebody uh, hear the question? Can you repeat it, Steve, once again? How often do you need to enter the chest and what are the technical modifications? Okay, no, no, I got the question. So, 
uh, normally when we when we use this incision about at the eleven of the tenth to eleven rib, uh, we do not enter in the we do not enter in the pleural cavity. Uh, however, sometimes uh, we have seen that when we extend posteriorly this incision, it might happen it might happen to enter to the pleural cavity. In this case, is something that we don't want it. But however, as I said, we can put a chest tube for one day, or first we can put a, a, a tube chest. We can ask the anesthesiologist at the end of the surgery to deflate the lungs and then to have put the stitches around the opening and just uh, withdrawn the catheter. So this is the maneuver that we normally do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, please? Uh, let me uh, ask a very short question. Do you usually, yes, uh, I, I didn't see if you uh, have uh, uh, mobilized spleen, pancreas, and uh, stomach or not in this situation. This is a retroperitoneal or, approach, okay, without, not a rooftop okay. approach. So these are this is totally mobilized as the peritoneal the, cavity uh, turns the, medially. The left renal was, I think, uh, a little uh, abo above. I mean, the, the, the right was lower and... Uh, no, it was... Uh, th this, this was... Uh, we saw uh, the ligation this, this, of the vein. Th this, this was... Uh, According to the reporting standards that has been have been published in 2020, if this was a pararenal arteries, that means that yeah. both the, the two uh, renal arteries were involved. So we prepared, and you saw the the left renal artery. The right renal artery was inside. We didn't see the right renal artery because it was from the from inside. So we just put the. I'm sorry. The it was in the vessel loop. Yes, the right one now. Yes, we didn't when, see when, the, the left. We didn't see the right one. We saw the left one. We saw the left renal artery. And that was the left renal artery. Uh, you you cannot see. You, you can see only the the ostium of the right renal artery from inside. This is how you proceed with the dropping down and approach. Yeah. I have also another comment, rather rather than a question, is that in selected patients, where the distance between the renals and the SMA is long enough, the clamp can be easily and should be placed below the SMA in cases of juxta renal replace. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Are there any other questions? If not, status. Hey, we don't hear you so well. Yeah. Okay. She said that that was okay. Good. But uh, if you would like to move to the next one, because we have exactly. time yeah. and uh, thank you, please. Uh, if there are no uh, other uh, questions, uh, call the last uh, presenter. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we will move to the last talk by Professor Ian Loftus from London on the value of the registries and quality improvement in the provision of vascular services. Ian. Thank you. Can you see my slides and hear me? Absolutely. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for asking me to join and I send you all my best wishes from London, especially to Professor Liapis and I congratulate all of his uh, excellent uh, attributes to vascular surgery over the years. Uh, I'm grateful to speak about registries. I've been involved in the UK national registries now for approaching 15 years. And of course, registries date back before my time. They started in the 1990s in some countries, and there are now a whole number of them across the international vascular community, but all different in certain ways. And I'll touch on some of those uh, shortly. Because of the differences of how they're run and how they're established, there are variable rates of participation, which is important in how we interpret the sort of data that come from these registries. In the UK, we had a society-run national audit for many years, but this became a government-funded vascular registry, and I'd like to just touch on a little more detail of that. We also feed these data into the two international registries, which have definite roles in quality improvement, the VASCONET, which everyone's aware of, and the International Consortium of Vascular Registries, 
uh, and there's been valuable output in quality improvement and international variation in practice from both of these registries. Just again to touch on our own home-based UK system, this is government funded uh, at least for the next two years and initially this was funded because of concerns about patients having uh, the ability to look up individual surgeons data so on this is controversial but this was the rationale for funding such a registry and in effect it is mandatory this isn't particularly well policed but we are supposed to put all cases in and indeed we know we get about 95 percent of all aortic carotid and lower limb cases submitted so it's fairly robust those data are used in a number of ways they're made available to hospitals, but they're made available to the public, and I'll show you how that's done. And we also have annual reports that are circulated to patients, patient groups, um, healthcare groups, and individual hospitals. So if any of you want to know what we do, you can look us up on this uh, publicly available website. You can look up Colin, who I know is in your room, uh, by name or by hospital. You can look up me if you wish. Uh, and we also have these annual reports which are available on this website. And this is the sort of data that's available to the public. So this is just happens to be my own hospital. The volume of aneurysms performed over three years with our mortality. So the mortality on the y-axis, the number of operations on the x-axis. And you can see what our mortality rate is and our length of stay. And it compares it to all of the other hospitals in the country. Similarly, we then can look at all of the individual surgeons in my own unit. I'm one of those red dots. I'll let you guess which one, but my colleagues are also there. So again, a patient is able to check and see exactly how many cases I do and what my results are. I'll talk on how that's been useful in terms of quality improvement. We were slightly shocked some 13 years ago when Vascunet reported on a variation in aneurysm mortality, which showed the UK was by far the worst of all of those countries that submitted data to Vascunet, with an aneurysm mortality approaching 8%. And this was pretty much the worst internationally. And part of the rationale, part of the reason for that was the impact of case volumes on outcomes. So we had lots and lots of hospitals doing small numbers of aortic cases with high mortalities. And this was shown by Peter Holt's work in the around the same time as that Vasconet data. And this shows that in terms of quintiles, the more cases you do, so quintile five, you halve the mortality from your surgery. So it took no one by surprise. The more you do, the better you are at it. But what we did was to use our registry data to drive a quality improvement program over a five year period to reduce that national variation and that national unacceptably high mortality. We developed a quality improvement program involving a number of meetings nationally and locally, data sharing both to the public and to healthcare groups, sharing of good and less good practice perhaps more importantly, a process of centralization of all specialist services. And that was also done through a provision of vascular services document. If you want to see this, it's on the vascular site of the UK's website. But we set a minimum number of 60 aneurysms per unit per year. And again, the registry was used to drive this change and it had a significant impact on the number of hospitals doing aortic surgery. This was England prior to centralization. This was afterwards. So you can see how many centers stopped. And in London, numerous hospitals doing aortic surgery. And after the publication of the data, that dropped to just a handful. Thankfully, mine and Collins are still on there. And what has that done? Well, using data from our registry on outcomes and volumes and all of the other related uh, data sets, we've managed to drive our mortality down from eight, over 8% 8 in 2006 to now 1%. And we know these data are correct. Now, of course, there are many factors involved. It's not just volume, it's endovascular repair and lots of other factors. But there's no doubt that registry data has been used to significantly reduce our aneurysm mortality. 
The second area, just to touch on briefly, is the issue of timing of carotid endarterectomy. We know from historical data from Rothwell that the highest risk of patients having a stroke is in the first few days of a TIA. So we really need to be doing our carotid endarterectomies as soon after a TIA as possible. And we know that that has an impact on the number of people we treat. So if we treat everybody within two weeks of a TIA, we only need to treat three to prevent a stroke. If we leave it four weeks, we need to treat nine to prevent a stroke. And Ross Naylor speaks on this data regularly. So when we looked at our own data from the registries, we were waiting on average more than 40 days following a cerebral ischemic event to surgery. So that really means many patients aren't getting the benefit that surgery should give them. So again, we used our registry data to drive a quality improvement program over five years in over 20,000 people. And the real thing we wanted was to take out the variation across units. These bars show every unit doing carotid endarterectomy across England and the variation in time from symptom to surgery. And by publishing that and making it available, it drives, we're all very competitive, it drives us as surgeons and drives the units to reduce their waiting times and to compete with those centres that are able to provide a service within three or four days. So what has that done? Well, again, over five years, we saw a dramatic reduction in the time from symptom to surgery for patients with carotid endarterectomy. And on average now in the UK, we're down to around 10 days. It's difficult to get to much less than that, but that will have significant benefits in terms of the overall stroke risk reduction in this group of patients. And of course, one of the things we'll worry about as surgeons, well, if we operate quickly, does that put them at a higher risk of perioperative stroke? Well, it doesn't. Maybe in that first one or two days, there's a slight increase in the crude rate of stroke and death, but it's slight. So uh, this mirrors a lot of the data from other international registries. Here are data from the Swedish registry, but perhaps more importantly, the German registry was a huge national registry double the number of patients we had in our own study, which again shows operating in patients early after a TIA or a stroke is safe. So there's no need to wait 14, 20, 40 days. We've got to get these done quickly. So registries are ideally suited to use these sort of data to drive that sort of quality improvement. So how do I see the role of these registries and ours fitting amongst all of the others? I think they all highlight variations in practice, which is important for us to be aware of. The national registries are particularly valuable to our own individual practices and can be used to drive really important quality improvement programs across all aspects of vascular surgery. One of the controversies around this though, is it? I think it has to be mandatory. I, I don't think we can have systems where it's data are just submitted at the whim of the individual surgeon. We have to have a form of making them mandatory and that data has to be open to scrutiny by people outside of our own units. Now to do that is expensive. Our own registry costs quite a lot of money, but that money can be used within a healthcare system to save costs, because if you can provide better services and better pathways, the better outcomes that will be achieved will lead to ultimately cost savings. Again, thank you very much indeed. I'm very grateful to be asked to speak at this meeting, and I do wish you very, all the best uh, in, uh, in Greece. I'll try and understand my screen. Thank you very much, uh, Elon, Professor Loftus. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the participants, please? Uh, Stavros, there is your own question from the, here from Professor Lazarus. Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hi, hi, Anne from Athens. It's a really pleasure to meet you again, even remotely, uh, after so many years. Uh, just just before uh, setting the question to you, I'd like to, give, to grab the opportunity to to say just a couple of words about Professor Liapis. Uh, I would like to say that although I didn't have a chance to to work closely with him, I must say that he's one of very few persons I could actually number no more than three in my uh, life as a as a surgeon and as a, a physician that uh, uh, actually 
played that, such a significant role in choosing vascular surgery and all of his being uh, someone that has been uh, uh, something I'm looking forward to him uh, with great respect and I'd like to express my gratitude for this. Thank you, Professor. And uh, Ian, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Actually, uh, I would like to thank you because you, you brought into light what are the the benefits and uh, the advantages and uh, uh, all uh, the good stuff that can you can someone get from uh, uh, registries nowadays. And uh, just uh, I would like uh, to to ask you just a couple of questions. First, uh, I would like to know uh, how can you deal? How do you deal in your in your uh, registry with uh, with the, the, the validation of, of the data? And the, the accuracy of the data that that uh, inserted in, uh, in in the registry. Uh, we, we do run here uh, a vascular registry in in Greece, and this is one of our major problems that we're not quite sure how how valid and how accurate are the data. And the second, uh, you said about the cost and significant cost. Just to to have an idea, what what is the let's say the annual cost or the annual funding that uh, a registry like yours. Uh, has to to get in order to to run uh, uh, in a smooth in a smooth way. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you very much. That's two really good questions. The validation of the data is difficult, but essentially the important thing for us is that the registry is held, analysed, and run by an independent body. So it's actually run through a group through our Royal College of Surgeons, but they are funded by a separate NHS organisation and, and it does sit out with the Vascular Society and Vascular Surgeons per se. And I think that's really important. They can analyse the data with a slightly different perspective and they cross-check the data that's submitted with data within our what are called our hospital episode statistics. So we can get a good idea of how accurate it is. It's not perfect but at least there is a process of cross-checking and validating, uh, particularly with the number of procedures done, the length of stay and death. And, and I guess they're the kind of key thing. So we can cross-check that. But again, that sort of links into the cost of that, because if you're going to have an independent group running a registry and providing the quite complex software, which is, of course, data protected and password protected and held um, centrally, that that can cost up to, depending on the size of it, a, a million euros per year. Um, now, the one thing I would say is that I, I do think we should all be looking at a very different way of funding these sort of registries. And for me, the natural source of funding should should be through industry. That doesn't mean industry should control registries. But we think of all the devices that you've seen this morning, the stent grafts we use, the adjuncts, all of the other bits and pieces we use in our in our practice routinely. I think there should be a way of top slicing some of the funding that comes with that and using that for all of our national and international registries to make it much better funded and therefore more robust. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve, I, I'm sorry to say that if you don't mind, we will uh, close the session now because there will be a ceremony for uh, Professor Yapis. Unfortunately, uh, Thanasis Yanovas and Steve uh, Karkos is good not uh, with us. Uh, everybody, thank you for uh, attending this interesting session. I think we had a very valuable speakers and a good quality of conversation. So we will uh, go on. Uh, Professor Ogielakos. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Ian. We're very grateful for your uh, participation in the very interesting talk. And uh, now we move on with uh, the, uh, the the last part of our symposium, which is presentation of awards uh, to Professor Lapis and to Synenesis. And we have the representative of Synenesis here, Mr. Busius, and uh, we're very grateful he came. I will start with uh, Professor Lapis. Professor Lapis will be honored to present you with, uh, with a block and inscription uh, that highlights your con contribution to our unit. So this is the block of inscription. Thank you very much. 
for all your contribution. Just open it for you. I mean, say a few words. Yes, of course. Okay. Please do. <clears throat> well, I have to be very careful with what I'm saying because my boss and for almost 50 years combined is in the room, so I'm not free to just express myself. Uh, nevertheless, I have to express my gratitude, uh, especially to Professor Gerulakos. Uh, the administration of uh, the hospital uh, and the uh, medical school uh, of the Athens uh, University uh, for bestowing this honor of me. Uh, I have to admit that uh, very few people in life uh, were as lucky as I was to have a successor of the quality of uh, Professor Gerulakos, uh, not only on a personal level, but for his vision uh, and his uh, efforts to improve uh, the quality of uh, the Department of uh, Vascular Surgery. Uh, creating a department is like having uh, a newborn baby, but then seeing this uh, improving in life and then having babies on its own, as we see together, here with the creation of uh, the unit of complex aneurysm unit uh, is indeed a very rewarding uh, thing to see. Uh, but I, I had to warn you, Professor Gerulakos, uh, creating a complex aneurysm unit uh, is a very bold movement. As Harry Truman uh, was saying, the buck stops here. That's an indication that uh, uh, the best of the best will work here with you and that you're going to uh, provide the best results for the patients. And we've heard beautiful presentations from our distinguished uh, friends from abroad and also the presenters here from Greece about the value of centralization and the value of registries and the value, of course, and above all of uh, good training. And uh, I'm happy that I can see that the environment uh, is changing and that uh, you can uh, achieve your goals. Hopefully, when this pandemic will go away, then people will again realize the importance of having high quality centers of excellence like the Articon and uh, the Department of Vascular Surgery that you run. Again, grateful for all you have done, grateful for the presentations today. I'm extremely happy. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, uh, Professor Lampus, for your kind words. We really appreciate your support throughout all these years. It made it easier for me to have somebody I can discuss in there. I have a helpful advice, and we're always there when we ask you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we done with the photography? No, no, we'll have to give also a presentation. All right, we're following <laughs> orders, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm holding this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, so the next part, the, the final part of our symposium is a presentation of a, of a block with an inscription uh, honoring the contribution of Synenosis, uh, which is uh, the Greek ship owner social welfare company. As you know, the last 10 years have been difficult in Greece with the financial crisis. So we couldn't do all our work exclusively as a state hospital exclusively uh, being based on contributions from the Ministry of Health. Uh, donors have, been, have played a very important part of uh, what we do and this type of services we can provide. Uh, we were privileged and honoured uh, to receive uh, a, a significant award from Synenesis 
We're very grateful to Synesis and please convey to the president of the Greek Ship Owners uh, uh, Association, Social Welfare Company, uh, our, our sincere thanks for uh, their, their significant contribution that made it easier for us to provide high quality services. So please come to the podium and uh, you can say a couple of words if you like, and uh, I'm going to provide to you this uh, commemorative block as a token of our appreciation. This is uh, for Synesis. So Thank you very so much. So you can uh, take a look there, Thank the you. picture. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you. you. Say everything about yes, Synesis. Yes. You can say a few words if you like. I have uh, prepared uh, in Greek. In Greek, yes, in Greek. Okay. I think most people are Greek. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. A few words. A few words. On yes. behalf of uh, the board of Synesis. Yes. Εκ μέρου του Διοικητικού Συμβουλίου, θα ήθελα να σα ευχαριστήσω για τη σημερινή τελετή προ τιμή τη Εταιρεία Κοινωνική Προσφορά του Ελληνικού Εφοπλισμού Συνένωση και τη πρωτοβουλία μα για παροχή ειδικού εξοπλισμού στην Αγιοχειρουργική Κλινική του Νοσοκομείου Αττικών. Στο μακρύ ταξίδι τη, η ναυτιλιακή οικογένεια έχει αφήσει ανεξίτηλο το αποτύπωμά της σε κάθε σημαντική περίοδο της χώρας μας, ενώ η κοινή επιθυμία τόσο των παλαιότερων όσο και των νεότερων μελών της να συνεχίσει να προσθέτει το δικό της θετικό πρόσημο στην ιστορία της πατρίδας μας. Τα παραπάνω οδήγησαν το 2016 στην ίδρυση της συνένωση η οποία είναι το μόνιμο όχημα συλλογική συνεισφορά της Ενώσεως Ελλήνων Εφοπλιστών στην ελληνική κοινωνία. Πρόκειται για τον φορέα υλοποίηση έργων αλληλεγγύης και ευπίας του ελληνικού εφοπλισμού, που αφογκράζεται τις ανάγκες της κοινωνίας και αναλαμβάνει τα τελευταία χρόνια σημαντικές πρωτοβουλίες για τη στήριξη του τόπου, καθώς μόνο το 2020 έχει διαθέσει σε αυτόν τον σκοπό περισσότερα από 20 εκατομμύρια ευρώ. He said that uh, during the last uh, during the last 20 years, uh, the the Greek Ship Owners Welfare Association has contributed more than 20 million uh, uh, euros uh, to to good causes uh, in various uh, aspects of uh, the Greek society, including health. Ε, κυρίως εστιάζει σε ενέργειες του τομεί επισητιστική βοήθεια, κοινωνική πρόνοια, παιδεία, ναυτική εκπαίδευση, έργα δημοσίου ενδιαφέροντος και αντιμετώπιση κρίσεων. Μεγάλη έμφαση έχει επίσης δοθεί λόγω και των ιδιαίτερων συνθηκών που διαμόρφωσε η πρωτόγνωρη υγειονομική κρίση στον τομέα της υγείας και της ενίσχυσης του Εθνικού Συστήματος Υγείας με σημαντικές δωρές μηχανημάτων και υλικών σε μεγάλο αριθμό νοσοκομείων για την καλύτερη παρακολούθηση της εξέλιξης και της αντιμετώπισης της νόσου COVID-19 και πρόσφατα για την απρόσκοπτη υλοποίηση του έργου εμβολιασμών σε όλη τη χώρα. Ε, σε αυτό το ευρύτερο πλαίσιο εντάσσεται και η δωρεά μας στο νοσοκομείο Αττικών και ειδικότερα η παροχή ακτινοσκοπικής τραπέζης για τις ανάγκες της Άγγιοχειρουργικής Κλινικής, μετά από αίτημα του καθηγητή κυρίου Γερουλάκου. Και χαιρόμαστε όταν πληροφορηθήκαμε από τον καθηγητή που μας ανέλησε την αναβάθμιση των υπηρεσιών της κλινικής προς τους αρισθενείς συνανθρώπους μας. Και καθηγητά σας ευχαριστούμε για τη δυνατότητα που μας δώσατε να φανούμε χρήσιμοι στην κοινωνία και να πιάσουν, όπως λέει ο Αλλάος μας, τόπο τα χρήματα που δαπανήθηκαν. Ε, εδώ θα, θα μου επιτρέψετε να πω ότι η συνένωση αποτελεί το μοναδικό σε συλλογικό επίπεδο φορέα στην πατρίδα μας, κοινωνικής αλληλεγγύης, επιχειρηματικού κλάδου. Γιατί οι εφοπλιστές είναι ένας επιχειρηματικός κλάδος που μάλιστα δραστηριοποιείται εκτός Ελλάδος. 
αποδεικνύοντας το υψηλό αίσθημα κοινωνικής υπευθυνότητας που χαρακτηρίζει διαχρονικά την ελληνική εναυτιλία, παράλληλα και ανεξάρτητα από τις σημαντικές ατομικές πρωτοβουλίες μελών της ναυτιλιακής κοινότητας. Σας ευχαριστώ που με ανεχθήκατε για το χρονικό διάστημα αυτό και θα ήθελα να σας ευχαριστήσω πραγματικά για άλλη μια φορά γιατί αυτό που σας είπα είναι πολύ σημαντικό για μας να πιάνουν τόπο τα λεφτά που τα χρήματα που δαπανούν. Ευχαριστώ ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ. Κυρίες και κύριοι, ευχαριστούμε πολύ που ακολουθούσατε το συμπόσιο. Νομίζω ότι ήταν, ήταν πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Είχαμε εξαιρετικού ομιλητέ και η παρουσία σα uh, μα θύμισε ιδιαίτερω. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending uh, this symposium on complex aortic aneurysms. Uh, we uh, extend our sincere thanks to our international faculty that uh, contributed uh, tremendously to, to the level of the symposium. And, the level of presentation and uh, presentations and discussions. Thank you very much. We hope to, to see you again at some point. Thank you.